welcome back to uh, Books du Jour. And uh, we put a fantastic panel for you, as always. And um, let me introduce my guest. It's our first panel on fiction we're doing. And my first guest is from Russian-born, Lara Babniar, The Scent of Pine, which, uh, is it out already, or? Yes. It's already out, okay. And then we go to Brewster, someone who lives actually in Brewster. That's not the name of a character, although it could be, right? Yeah. Mark Slooker. And the book is also out, I believe. It is. It is out. Yeah. And uh, my next guest, it's Emon White. Do I need to introduce him? I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he has uh, written numerous books, and most recently, uh, Jack Holmes and His Friends, and this is a new one, Inside the Pearl. So welcome to Books du Jour. Uh, you teach at, uh, you say, uh, creative writing at NYU. Like you. you talk a lot about um, novels in your story. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your uh, creative process, uh, that uh, reading fiction is also about the writing of it? Yes, and also um, I teach my students because my students are incredibly smart and well read. But sometimes I find that they're far away from real life. So I try to bring them back to life. I come up with these assignments for them. For example, last time I brought some real snow from the ground to mm. class and asked them to write about that snow, to describe the snow without using the words white or cold. So, and I even encourage them to taste the snow, S seeing snow, tasting snow, mm -hmm. smelling snow, awaken their senses, and I think that's very important for fiction. Yeah, and your story is based uh, in Russia and in, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, well, in the Northeast, I would say, because back and forth. You feel like because there is an ambivalence about you to know where you, b you belong? You, you, are you Americans and, or not quite American, or never quite a Russian either? Never thought about this, but probably yes, <laughs> yes, because I feel, um, I still feel kind of an in-between state. I, part of me, a large part of me belong to Russia, and yet another part of me is um, growing to like it here more and more. Mm -hmm. All of my books, all of my stories deal with Russia and with Russians in America. Okay. I haven't yet mastered a perfect American character, Wardman. Since we're talking about uh, place, the, the weight of place in one's life and identity, uh, Brewster, this is where you live, correct? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's the first novel you write about the place? Yeah, probably the first one okay. that's really located in one place, that's right. How was the process of writing about a place where you live in a fictional way? Well, I mean, I think the two bleed into each other all the time. Uh, how? It's, you have to, well, it's set in the late 1960s, for example. Okay, so yeah. you have history sort of forcing itself on the present. So now I can't go for a walk around Brewster without seeing my characters That's walking right, yeah. around, disappearing into the woods, going up to the reservoir. It, it's fascinating to me the way mm. history and fiction are sort of constantly permeating each other. Mm. Um, but then again, that's true of history too. My, you know, you were talking about sort of just getting to like it here. Yeah. I've been here 56 years and I'm still getting to like it here. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, my first language was Czech. I, I grew up in a Czech ghetto, so. Um, Where was a Czech ghetto? In Queens, New York. In Queens, New York, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it still there, or is this pretty yeah, much no, now it's, it's probably been dismantled? Dominican or Jamaican or something. Jamaican, okay. Um, I mean, a typical immigrant experience, experience. right? Um, but is there a conflict in your identity when you write? Is it <laughs> like, you know, you still, you say like you're still trying to, to, sure. to pertain here. Is it like you feel like you're still in between two identity or cultural identity? I think conflict is putting it too lightly. It's, it's schizophrenic. I mean, okay. It really is. It's, um, it's bipolar. It's, um, I don't know what the term is. Um, I had a friend who was uh, brought up uh, by Czech parents in America, and he felt they were always afraid there was going to be another pogrom or something. And oh they, yeah. were, they were terrified for him to cross the street, and the, any little cold caused him to cover him with Vicks vapor up. <laughs> did you have very uh, worried parents like that? No, I think they were too busy sort of clawing yeah. at each other for, for 40 years to, to worry that much about me. Mm -hmm. They had one of those ethically bad marriages. <laughs> um, and I was an only child, so it was the nuclear family sort of under the magnifying glass. Uh -huh. You just think of the ants in the magnifying glass. That was kind of us. <laughs> it was, but out of that comes, I mean, if there isn't some dysfunction, what do you, what do you write about? Um, I was interested in what you were saying about uh, you don't have quite yet have the courage to write about pure Americans, uh, but, but I'm thinking about Mavis Gallant, who died recently, mm -hmm. and who was Canadian, but lived and wrote in English, but lived her whole life in Paris. And she was one of the few English-speaking writers in Paris that I ever knew who would write about Parisians with other Parisians. 
I mean, there were no Americans or Canadians, or I mean, they were sometimes, but but she could write a whole story about the about the French, and that was quite interesting, really. Yeah. And was it with different views uh, on the French, different from the French view? She brought to it the kind of uh, um, interest in manners and morals that mm. that English language writers have. Uh, so it was a little more detail, a little more alive to the quirks of the individuals. Or oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 And it was interesting about three of these because I put it, I put it together. It's uh, you have something in common. Mm. It's like you're all right about the past, you know. And um, even your present still, uh, it's as I say, it's punctuated by flashback. It seems like you can only make sense of a present if you can understand the past. And is it safer for? I mean, is, is it like uh, we need the hin the hindsight to be able to to write about the past with clarity? Is, is it safer? Safer? Or is it better? Or is it more uh, approachable? I think it's almost inevitable that we okay. want to answer it. So I think I mean this almost literally. Anything, mm. any moment that is past becomes it enters the domain of fiction. So if, if I tell my wife tonight about our conversation around the table, it'll be a kind of a story. I'll leave out certain things. I'll make myself sound smarter. You know, I'll, I'll stress it. Yeah, yeah. Things, you corrupt you know. it. Yeah, I'll, I'll corrupt it. And yeah. I think that's not just personal history, memory, but it's mm -hmm. also history sort of writ large, right? I mean, it's, it's a selective kind of fictional process on mm -hmm. some level. In, in my case, I'm always afraid of, uh, that I'm not in touch with things that are going on right now because I'm so old. So I, uh, I think that, well, if I set stories in the 70s or the 80s, I, I remember that pretty well. Yeah. Or the 50s or 40s. 50s, yeah. yeah. The setting also is very important to all of you, you know? I mean, you talk about Paris. I mean, do, do you feel like in your bones you ever left Paris? Because it doesn't, when reading you, it doesn't feel like you, you feel like you're still there. I wrote most of this book in the hospital. I'd had a stroke, oh, and okay. I, would, I couldn't walk and I couldn't talk, but I could still scribble. So uh, it was nice to dream about Paris while I was lying in mm -hmm. a dreary hospital room. At least you could still. Yes, very good. Well, you recovered very well. Well, that's <laughs> often the case, yeah. So the the story of um, of Brewster came came about to you how? So um, it was based, I think, on a um, on a on a friendship that I had as a mm -hmm. as a kid. 15-year-old kid with a, um, a very tough older boy, and uh, he had a little brother named Gene who he loved in a way I hadn't really encountered before. It was, it was a different kind of love, and, um, and I think the two of them have sort of slept in my head for a long time. And um, When you say different kind of love, what do you mean? He lied on our tracks for that too. I see. Mm -hmm. But he was a 15-year-old, he was a 15-year-old tough kid who was getting into fights all the time. But very paternal toward his little Absolutely, brother. Yeah. absolutely. Partly because his, his family situation was not, not good. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we formed this friendship for a while. Um, and I, I think I needed to, to deal with it. What's interesting is I have this, this notion that our, our books write us as much as we write our books. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the things that we end up saying end up surprising us sometimes in hindsight. Sometimes very obviously, I didn't realize that in Brewster, the, the narrator's younger brother dies very young. Mm -hmm. And the surviving brother, the narrator, is, is sort of invisible to his family. It wasn't until months later that I realized that what I'd done really is, is sort of split myself in two. Because my mother and I had a very close relationship when I was young. By the mm -hmm. time I was eight, I'd vanished, I'd disappeared. Uh, she had nothing to say to me. And so I just literalized it. The ideal brother dies, mm. the older brother lives oh, on, see, unseen, yeah. invisible, saying, I'm right here, I'm standing right mm. in front of you. And the mom gets Alzheimer, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. So now I'm banished literally from her memory, the way I was yeah, sort of right. erased from my childhood. So Do you think about a, a novel for two or three years before you write it? No, I'd mostly I just flounder and flop around and mm -hmm. try to work my way into the wilderness and there's no path. I just fail a lot. Uh -huh. so you, then, you, um, you mean uh, you, you start and then you discard yeah, what you've got? I start and then I, and because I don't have the courage to, mm. to recognize that it's, it's not what I want, I, I kind of tend to keep flogging it until it just... You feel like you have to yeah, get a, the story clearly. I, I think the, the analogy for me is that I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening for a kind of a tune, mm. something that's, that's, okay. that's right. And you don't know that you've got it until you hear it. And then suddenly you're in, you're mm. in the vein. 
you feel like uh, being heard it seems to be very important to, yeah. to hear you if you like this you, you want to be to you want to go to the the heart of humanity I think most of all I don't want to condescend I think that's like mm. that's that's very important to, to the characters or to, to, the, character, the, to, to the characters to the story uh -huh. because yeah. I think it's very easy to condescend in all kinds of ways wow. you can condescend by romanticizing you can condescend by making it unnecessarily dark and violent mm. and if they don't break my heart along the way they're not going to touch anyone yeah. else either yeah. that's where your your book I, I just have to say this I think it's one of the great memoirs which one of the he's got few boys on story oh boys on story it's one of the great memoirs of the yeah. Yeah, but that was a big that was your break please uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Talent, yeah. that's you what I meant to write to you that's right <laughs> well then you get the chance to make yeah. voice it so Laura do you uh, uh, think out a whole story before you write it or, or does is your story come from your own life pretty much sometimes I feel that the story is so powerful just like you said the story wants to write itself and a strange uh, thing happened to me with my latest story for New Yorker. It's called Catania. I started writing it um, seven years ago. I written about three pages. It was about something really important to me, and mm -hmm. I loved my characters. And then I stopped simply because I didn't know how to end it and what's going to happen next. And only seven years later, I had this insight how to end it, so I finished the story. You don't have that problem, yeah. You have an idea, you, you keep going. This book I rewrote several times. I mean, I wrote it, and then it was edited, and then I rewrote it, and uh, I couldn't seem to uh, group the different themes. It was sort of stream of consciousness. Uh, I was going to ask you um, about your novel, uh, because you write uh, the Lena character mm -hmm. when she's young and then when she's older and in America. I couldn't quite tell the time frame when you are in Russia, we're talking about uh, late eighties or early nineties. Where mid eighties, the absence of politics, because uh, Perestroika or Glasnost was happening, mm -hmm. and you left that part pretty much out. It was it intentional, or was it just when you were a kid in the camp, it just didn't happen. My idea was to write a story about uh, a woman or a young girl, young woman, yeah, uh, coming of age romantically. And when that happens to you, when you're having your first sexual experience, your first love, you could care less about politics. That's what really happens. Mm -hmm. so like Jane Austen never mentions the Napoleonic War. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not once. <laughs> so I think that, especially when you're writing about younger characters, um, I think people alive at a certain point aren't really fully aware that they're alive at that point, that point until yeah. years later. You know, when if you were alive during the Enlightenment, you didn't think, oh my gosh, I'm alive during the Enlightenment. It was only later that you they, know, they're called it. Things. That's right. Um, I think children are so assailed by their yeah. mood, mood that they live in this kind of uh, uh, cloudy, ghostly world of mood. And then only when they're older do, uh, does the historical moment impinge mm -hmm. on them. And you understand what you lived yeah. through yeah. and what was happening. Or you don't. Or you don't, <laughs> which is also yeah. possible. Did you find in the 80s there was some remnant of the uh, six uh, le, le Grève of 68? The older people uh, who were very bourgeois and mm. even aristocrats would uh, nevertheless uh, talk dirty all the time. Uh, I mean, I was am amazed by how filthy mouths the, the French were, uh, and especially these older princesses and things. The French is a dual language, as you know. There's Largo, Largo. <laughs> and then it's French. I yeah. know, and and all these people were very proud of speaking Argo, yeah, and uh, calling it a voiture, a, a bagnole, bagnole yeah, uh, I guess, you know, a girl, yeah. or the, uh, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. The the people you met there, um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I'm talking about story, Michel Foucault, for example. Yeah. I find it very interesting because the people talk about Foucault, but uh, the history of sexuality or the, the story of madness in civilization. But you talk about Foucault and his his sexuality. I would take him around in New York because that's where I first met him. And okay. of course nobody knew who he was. Uh, people didn't recognize his face. But then when we got to Paris, I said, well, let's go to a gay bar tonight. And he said, I, I don't dare because people know me too well. And I said, oh, that's rubbish. You're just imagining things. And then we went to a, a bar called the Hotel Central. And people start coming toward him like the night of the living dead, you know. <laughs> and, and he had to run out the side door and jump in a taxi because he was too famous.
you get a solicitation from uh, newbies uh, asking you to read their book? No, or I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not on the radar. You're not on the radar? And I'm trying to stay off of it. Okay. <laughs> Do, well, you obviously you're teaching, so people ask you all the time for feedback or oh, yes. yeah, novel. You would read my novel if I give it to you? <laughs> do, do you read Gary Steingart? No, yes. He's really good, though. I yeah, think. yeah. Really good. You know, but I, I was amazed by his uh, uh, his most recent book that it was as serious as it was not just laughter, but a lot of uh, sad mm -hmm. things and serious things. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, the the memoir. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Did it inspire you to write another one with no, sarcasm? No. <laughs> <laughs> it made me wish I'd written mine better, but yeah. Now we enter sort of the digital. Uh, very uh, sort of uh, constantly busy minds in the digital world is are the writing suffering from that, or uh, is it, it was improved, or is I it? I just uh, happened to teach a class of writing in the digital age. Okay. So, and I find that this new generation of writers, they simply they can do things that our generation cannot do, okay. and they can do brilliant uh, original things like that. For example, my students um, did this project. They wrote a mystery novel um, on Facebook. So they wrote uh, a fake post on Facebook where a certain object was stolen. And then in the comments by different people, um, they tried to figure out who stole it and where that object mm -hmm. and how to return it. And it was so funny and so smart, so I really liked it. Yeah, no, so I feel a lot often uh, the digital it, it's smart, it's entertaining, but it leaves you also very empty. It, is f it fails to feed you. I mean, that's my experience at the moment. Oh, that's mine as well. For example, it is it too? Um, yeah. uh, if you take Pale Fire, it's one of my favorite novels. Me and too. I sure. admire yeah. it greatly, and I've read it many, many times, but it doesn't touch my heart. It's just that I don't think um, every book has to do that. No, of course not. There are, there are huge change in us, because I've, I've just I have this theory that we're, we're sort of being colonized by our own technologies. And that sounds well, and, and dramatic, and but I actually believe that. But this thing we used to know as reality is being encroached on in various ways. I think it is. The imagination and silence are sort of like endangered ecosystems now. They're mm -hmm. just being sort of winnowed down to the, kind of to the point of genetic liability. It's like, how long will this go on? And I saw it in my students. I saw kind of a fractured attention span. Mm -hmm. I see it in myself. Um, I have to fight to, to keep to, to margin. Off. You know, Thoreau had this wonderful line about wanting to keep a wide margin on his days. I like that line, mm. and I, I try to live by it. I think if I don't have that margin, not only can I not work, but I'm not sure that my, my life isn't beginning to suffer in various ways. Mm -hmm. Does um, that mean leisure? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, had a, I wrote an essay on, on just the power of leisure, because yeah. leisure also is a political force. Yeah. I mean, we need to be at rest to figure out what we believe. So I interview uh, Jonathan Crary, and he has a fantastic theory about the the, um, the abandon of leisure because all the gaps are closing yeah. off. So you go to the bus, you used to be with yourself, now you you're being engaged. So there's no more. You go shopping, people are in, uh, on their device for your TV. There's no more empty spaces where the mind can actually refresh or be with itself and be creative or uh, imaginative. No, it's constantly you engaged. You for a long walk by yourself and talking on the phone. That's right. You That's know, what I meant about colonization. Yes, I okay. Think we are sort of colonizing our inner space, yeah. our inner imaginative space, which is kind of the soil out of which we grow a self, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's how do, you do you write? Do you read on a device? Uh, Have you tried? Or you know, don't yes, know if you I do. I do you I find do. the experience different or not on the paper? When I read a book, I can remember it was about a third of the way through on the left. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, uh, the that's the mind, that's right. And now uh, you don't have those orientation uh, yeah. uh, features. So yeah. uh, it, it's harder to find a passage unless you mark mm. it as you read. Yeah. Do, you, do you read on the device too? Uh, I read on the device, and uh, the reason I like it is that uh, I can carry so many books yeah. with me. Yeah. young Americans are writing about the third world. I mean, they go to India or they go to Mexico. They yeah. used to uh, write about um, class conflict in their own country. Mm -hmm. And that was the basis, it still is the basis of the English, English mm -hmm. novel. And but there is just not enough conflict. Or, or they're not allowed to talk mm -hmm. about it. The Americans will turn bright red if you bring up their class origins. 
where they'll talk about wanting to have sex with their mother or whatever. The last taboo is to talk about class. 98% of Americans say that they're middle class. This includes the 1% and the and everybody else. Yes, yeah. And uh, so they all think they're middle class and they won't discuss it. That used to be the heart of the, mm. of the English language novel. But, is that, but it's not talking about the 60s, the late 60s, where the situationist was a big thing. And even the, the s viewing the world in terms of classes. Uh -huh. Maybe we are entering this new, uh, new territory where this we are thinking is not even important anymore. But yeah? there are also advantages to digital. Like for example, um, I look at my students and they're able to multitask in a way that our generation simply can't, and that can add to their fiction in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Like they can do several perspectives simultaneously, and that creates a pretty but interesting. Yeah. I read about it too in that multitasking. The, the brain is not designed for that. So the multitasking it becomes very sort of messy and half it's done. It's getting used to it. It's getting, You're getting uh, used to it? Yeah. If I'm writing a, a, a story, a novel, what have you, I'm, I'm still only writing one character at a time. Mm -hmm. I'm writing one line at a time. I'm inhabiting one perspective at a time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I guess I'm still unconvinced. I feel like multitasking is just another way of saying that we're not doing anything very well. And in, and in fact, I sometimes think that unitasking or whatever is going to be the wave of the future. Sure. So that I'm going to cook a meal. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to sit and eat that meal okay. and talk to somebody, you know, and that's it. So what's your day like? You get up, you do email for five hours, and then you <laughs> play games. And I mean, I'm, no, I'm being I silly, have, but what do you I do? I don't have a cell phone. So okay, you don't? Somebody, okay. Do they um, don't have service in Brewster? And it, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I mostly I, I palm it off on my wife. Okay. You take the call, you know, um, which is cowardly. No, but do you write full time? No. Okay. No, I, uh, I wish I could. I think if I have a good four, four or five hours of writing, I'm, oh. I'm spent. If I have a half an hour. I'm like a, I'm not like a mayfly in the current. It's just I'm, I'm gone. I'm he, when you read, you feel very stifled, repressed, very shy, and then you feel like little by little she, she cracks. Yeah. yeah and is that? The, the, the lust of the woman uh, has to express herself, is that the only way she can do it? It so happened that my sexual education, my own sexual education, as well as sexual education of my main character, mm -hmm. um, came from books, yeah. not from experience. <laughs> it was when I was growing up in Soviet Union, um, sex was never mentioned anywhere, and there was absolutely no information, so mm. I had to read Chaucer. And uh, as we discussed about politics, uh, we, when you're 18, you ignore politics and concentrate on falling in love. That's the way I read Chaucer. I ignored all the morals, all the um, stuff that he wanted to, to convey to the reader. I concentrated on the sex. I looked for the sex. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the way I read the Cameron and mm -hmm. books like that. Like that. Yeah. Did you, do you find it difficult to write sex scenes? Because this is the, I mean, I've had some, but, but Brewster is the first one where I've sort of dive into know, it, to dove into to it. Dive in. um, you know, and, and in the back of my mind was this fear that I'd end up on that, what is that, English awards, like the, the worst sex scenes in oh literature yeah. of oh the there, year. Yeah. You have to stand up there and read your, your horrible sex scene. Yeah, but you can't worry about that. Down no. down. Really, writing about sex is the opposite of pornography, because the, the, the design of pornography is to excite you mm -hmm. and to be a mm -hmm. kind of marital aid or something. The purpose of, of real sex writing is, is just realism, mm -hmm. to describe what actually goes on in your mind when you have sex, and it's usually comic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Henri Bergson talks about the body deserting the spirit. The, the body can't do what the spirit wants to do, mm -hmm. so that's essentially comic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've slept with so many men, you talk openly in your book, even this one. Are you planning to write a big, massive novel about the, the experience of itself, or? I, I think that would be a sign of senility, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it would be fun to write a kind of sad book, a yeah. Marquis de Sade book of all your adventures. It would be but a magn magnus opus. Yeah, to right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a beautiful place to write this episode on a warm and hot sexual note. Uh, we have The Scent of Spine by Lara Batmyar, her first uh, novel, her fourth book. We have Brewster with Mark Sluka, which uh, also is a beautiful book, and a memoir, Edmond White, My Years in Paris, and the title is Inside a Pearl. Who is a pearl?
managed to feed myself. Yeah, you know how you're not you're a pretty lousy guest, and you have not touched anything. Like, 